and welcome. I'm so happy that ma uh, many of us are here today. We're so honored to begin this days of, uh, of a lot of presentations with a remark from uh, um, uh, our guest of honor, Dr. Patricia Grady. And uh, we are very happy uh, and privileged to have her with us uh, for an entire day. And, and we are going to be benefited of a lot of uh, wise um, advice and thoughts that, that she, will going, uh, she will share with us. Um, the, to the topic of, of uh, the Dr. Grady's uh, remarks um, uh, is the state of nursing science. And I would like to ask you to just pause for a moment and think about the significance of this title. Um, if you look at the, the development of our uh, nursing discipline, you are going to um, notice that on a very remarkably you know, brief span of time, we have been able to advance our discipline um, uh, and really becoming a, a leader in, in uh, contributing to the science, creating, producing knowledge that is very important for, for saving lives, uh, for improving the health of our individual patients to communities to, you know, uh, globally. So we are right now a major agent in, in improving and transforming the healthcare and the health of, of, of the, the world. Um, but if you, I just want to walk you through the historical, you know, development of our, our discipline. It was less than 150 years ago that the first nursing program was developed in the United States. And it started with Nightingale schools that um, were established across the country. Um, the, those programs were really, you know, simply training of, of, of nurses and it was focused on um, technical, you know, medical bedside, you know, training. Uh, it was more um, the apprenticeship rather than, you know, academic um, uh, studies. And then it was well into the 20 centuries that we actually uh, could consider nursing education as an academic uh, education. That was the time that the nursing education very, uh, you know, uh, slowly uh, moved from hospital to the universities and to the, the colleges. But even then, um, it was not that we taught our students the knowledge that was pr produced by nurses or from the nursing discipline, it was to really using the knowledge that was produced by, by other health sciences. Um, and, and really, you know, still not being considered as a real academic um, uh, program. Um, then eventually the first BSN program was um, granted um, um, in 1937, I think it was. And it was not before 1956 that the first graduate program was granted. So it's see, you see how fast we and rapidly we have progressed from, you know, and uh, not even being considered as an academic program and, you know, uh, moving fast forward. Uh, it was in the mid 60s um, that six universities in the United States started offering PhD in nursing. And the majority of them offered a PhD in education, not nursing research. Um, but something happened in the late 60s, and I think that what happened was that all of a sudden, this country uh, promoted funding. It was all of a sudden, you know, a, a more, you know, care for, for science and research generally that led to um, the nursing science to really you know start advancing very rapidly and it was then that the nursing education for uh, as a you know discipline as a uh, science was uh, supported through the funding for for nursing science and eventually you know um, advancing of a PhD for, 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 for nursing leader for um, fulfilling the uh, global developmental goals uh, of, of the United Nations. 
Um, a lot of uh, nursing, um, academic nursing still don't um, uh, uh, grant PhD degrees for, for nurses and some of them are still, you know, um, linked uh, the nursing science as a part of medical science. But we see that there are um, a lot of progress, uh, progress going on. Here in the United States, the situation is a little bit, um, you know, concerning for me at least, and I just talked to uh, 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 with Dr. Grady about the decline of our PhD <coughs> enrollment. I am extremely worried about this situation because I, I just feel that as because we are still pioneering, you know, nursing science, where such a young discipline can uh, barely survive such, a, a, you know, hiccup or, or a, um, you know, roadblock that is now put in, in our, uh, the development of our, our, our science. So I hope that we, as one of the leading um, academic nursing institute in the country, work together with, with other uh, people who, uh, who share our concern to really find ways to uh, promote the PhD uh, programs and, and uh, find ways to strategically create a very uh, you know robust pipeline that will start from from the beginning from the applicants to our P B mm, bachelor's degree and uh, mm, uh, upward uh, because i think that although all the mm, you know investments uh, postdoctoral investments um, are very important and we need to not only continue with them but also enhance them but we also need to make sure that we backfill the pipeline because I really believe that without um, PhD prepared um, individuals in the future we are not going to have any nursing education. So no matter what, uh, what we preferred in, in our profession, in our discipline, whether it is research or education or service or whatever, without having educators to educate the next generations of nursing, we are, that will be devastating for the development of our, our, um, our, our profession and our discipline. Um, I, I know that this day will be full of wonderful and uh, very uh, productive discussion and I'm very happy that Dr. Grady is with us because we can not only um, you know express our gratitude for all the support that we have received um, from NINR um, in, in all these years but also having this opportunity to really hear firsthand from her her vision for the future and, and the, all the you know opportunities and challenges that, that our discipline uh, face uh, currently. Uh, by that, I would like to uh, once again thank Dr. Grady for, for um, carving out. I know that you are very busy and just flying from other side of the country here. It, it, um, it's a big deal and, and we really appreciate it. And I would like to ask uh, our Associate Dean for Research, Dr. Um, Joy Whitney, um, to come to the podium and introduce Dr. Grady. Thank you very much and enjoy the day. Uh, Thank you, Azita. Um, and thank you all for being here. This is really great. Uh, it's really my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Patricia Grady, who, um, as all of you know, directs the National Institute of Nursing Research, which is one of 27 institutes and centers at NIH. And uh, as, as probably most people in this room are familiar, the uh, NINR focuses on improving the health of individuals and communities, populations, across the lifespan, um, and really is about supporting the research that is the foundation of um, cost-effective care, the kind of evidence-based care that we all are striving to deliver. Um, you uh, probably know, you should know the main areas, and I know Dr. Grady will be also talking about these of NINR, which are symptom management, chronic illness, risk reduction, quality of life, palliative care, and uh, end-of-life issues. And um, Dr. Grady, those resonate with much of our science in the school, so um, we're very pleased about that. Dr. Grady, as you can imagine, uh, would not be director of NINR were she not an accomplished scientist herself. She's a member of the Academy of Medicine and also a number of other academies, including the American Academy of Nursing. 
She's also well published in her field, which is neuroscience, and also uh, is known for her papers on, the pers on perspectives in nursing science. And uh, even within something like the last five months, she's published several papers, um, and these address aspects of the role of nursing science in determinants of health, scientific innovations, collaborations, precision health, and the science of caregiving. Again, all things we have um, interest in. She holds a number of awards, a uh, number of honorary doctorates. She also received the Public Health Service Superior Service Award for Exceptional Leadership um, and is a past recipient of the NIH Merit Award. Uh, prior to her uh, directorship at NINR, she was faculty at Maryland in both the schools of medicine and um, nursing. So Dr. Grady last visited us in 2009, I believe. Uh, too much time has gone by. <laughs> We'd love to have you back more often. Um, so we are just so pleased that you could make the trip here. And we are looking for, we're going to keep you very busy all day. We're going to pick your brain. And um, I think you'll find that there are some similarities in our school since you were here in 2009. And we also have many new uh, vibrant faculty that are doing some exciting research, um, uh, some funded through NINR or NIH, so you're going to be hearing more from them throughout the day. We're excited to share with you, excited to hear from you, and uh, again, we appreciate you for coming, and I'd like to invite you. Please help me welcome Dr. Grady. Be here. Um, now I know you can all hear me. <laughs> I feel really, um, it's really exciting to be here. Actually, it, it felt like it was time to come back. I didn't realize it was quite as long as that. I, I thought it was here once in between. But, but as I was saying earlier this morning to, to Joey when I got here, it, I, you know, Seattle, University of Washington has a sort of a special place for me because I, it was one of the first places that I visited, one of the first academic centers after I took this position. And so I had been here before and had visited with the faculty and presented at Wynn and, and such, but, but it was just different and it was really a wonderful jump start to be able to hear so much of what was going on that was so important across the country. So, so I always feel that little twinge of familiarity, a little tug when I come back. So uh, it is really very nice to be here. Um, I'm looking forward, I, I looked at the schedule and I saw how many new people that you have who are doing exciting things and so I'm really looking forward to the whole day to be able to um, listen and get an update and hear the exciting things that are going on and the relevance on um, what you what you do here um, and have done here has always focused on relevance and impact and that's so important um, I today I will be going through a number of examples of things that we are funding and I've tried to go broad as opposed to deep so that I can give a sense of the many areas that we do have impact and that we do reach in and the many opportunities that are available. I also echo um, your Dean Azidi's words on the importance of the science and the urgency. Of, I would say that, of course, because I am the director of the National Student Nursing Research, but it is really, um, it's so important. And I, I, was, I was struck as I was listening to you, I was thinking that in the very beginning, and I wasn't here in the very beginning, but, but in the very beginning of the field, we were looking for mentors to help us, and we reached out to other disciplines because we didn't have those mentors internally. We were trying to, to learn, and, and that was a good thing because it set us up to be interdisciplinary and to be strong. And, and so then we have, we, it, the situation evolved so that we had more mentors in nursing. And so we were a little more inward, and now we're outward. But we want to be outward because it's beneficial, not because we have a lack of mentors in nursing in the field. And so I think it is really critical that we focus on that and, and that we think about why we do the science, why it's important, why it's exciting, and the fun that's in it. And not, and I know it's, it's human nature, but it's not, oh, I can't go out tonight, I have to go write that grant. Uh, it's really about what we can do and the difference we can make. And the fact that you can create new knowledge, that something that you've created, you're not like reading the textbooks, you're writing them. And, and so I think these are things that are so important and we get wrapped up in our everyday life and sometimes forget the nugget of what it was that was really exciting that got us started and, and really, um, is what fires us when we push away all the, the, um, uh, the detritus of everyday kinds of things. Um, so let me get started here. Uh, 
and talk a little bit, and, and uh, thanks to Joey, I have a couple of slides. I think I probably, <laughs> she's already covered some of my material, and I do sincerely thank you. But I, so I, just um, to review a little bit, which she's done quite well, the NIH and the NINR missions, just making sure that we, we keep the central focus. Um, also, our areas of science and some of the priorities that, that we are funding in which are reflected in the topical areas that we fund as well as our strategic plan. Um, and to give some examples of some of what uh, the uh, science that we are supporting that is making an impact and is um, opening up new um, areas as well. Um, and then uh, finishing up with some current trends and opportunities. And, um, and that's, a, again, a broad brush. And I will be, as, as we've said, available all day. And so uh, what questions we don't get answered after my talk, I'm happy to um, uh, answer um, as we go through the day. Uh, so moving uh, through these, um, it sounds like a lot, but it's actually a, a quick trip. Um, as Joey said, we are one of 27 institutes and uh, centers at the NIH. And so it is important that we conform to the overall NIH mission, which is to seek fundamental knowledge and the application of that knowledge, which is something we don't always hear quite as much about um, in some of the, um, the, the NIH webpage, but it's very much a part of that. Um, but within that, we each have our own specific contributions, which is why there are 27 of us um, established by constituencies, by Congress as a result of constituent support. Um, and so what we bring that's unique, uh, and the rest of NIH is, is moving in this direction, but, but what we have since the inception, uh, since our arrival on campus brought, is that we do focus on um, not just individuals, but also families and communities. And so we are the pioneers really in getting work out into the community and getting that science out. Um, also looking at wellness as opposed to illness. As you know, we have a National Cancer Institute, a National Institute of Arthritis. So, so many of the others really focus on illness. We focus on wellness. Um, we also focus across the lifespan. There's a Child Health Institute, an Institute on Aging, but we focus across the, the lifespan. Um, we also look at, as Joey also mentioned, um, quality of life, uh, which is something that was not on the agenda when we came to NIH. They weren't looking for less quality, but they just weren't focusing on that. Um, and so, um, and, and lastly, uh, which is something I'll mention again at the end, is that we do focus on caregivers as well as individuals who are struggling with their disabilities. And this is becoming more um, uh, embedded in the NIH across, across the campus, but it's something that we have pioneered. So the four, four areas that we do focus on, and those also were mentioned um, by Joey, the, um, the symptom science, which is more the in, focusing on symptoms and not just symptoms of illness, but sometimes symptoms of, of the treatment of illness or disability. Um, um, and so it really is more to address the personalized health issues of the individual. Um, wellness, I, I've mentioned, and that really yeah. is focused on prevention, primary prevention, secondary and tertiary as well. Um, Self-management, which is becoming so much more important as people are living longer and living with chronic illness. About over the age of 45, um, the numbers most recently said that over the age of 45, um, nearly the majority of people are, are experiencing at least one and usually more than one chronic problem. It can be something, you know, minor like a minor arthritis or it can be something that's more serious like uh, Parkinson's or, or MS or something of that sort. Um, and also end of life and palliative care. We are the lead on campus for end of life um, still. And that's an area, as certainly there are elements of all of these that you all have been pioneering in, but that is one in particular that you were um, pioneering in on this campus. And, and so we do, um, it does give us a good foundation to, to build on as we move forward. Um, so we have developed um, intramurally, uh, which is, a, uh, I, I guess I, most of you know we have an extramural program where most of the funds go, which is to you all. We also have an intramural program, which was designed to provide opportunities for doing research on campus. It is very collaborative with the extramural community and with the rest of the NIH campus. And so what we've designed, what we call a symptom science model, and there are several publications, so I won't go into great detail with you, but basically it starts with a symptom. Um, and, or a symptom complex, and then um, characterizes into a phenotype, 
uh, using bio clinical as well as biological data. And the idea is that using this approach that we can identify personalized strategies which um, may be, uh, which will mostly be non-pharmacological but may also lead to pharmacological interventions as well. So it really is a way to illuminate uh, personalized um, health. And so we are very, we're excited about that. It's beginning to be exported and um, we tried to make it a basic model that would be applicable across the board. So an example of some of the, the work that is ongoing there um, uh, of that symptom science is the work that is being done by Jessica Gill, who's a tenure track investigator in our intramural program. She is um, uh, studying um, uh, traumatic brain injury um, and PTSD and has among some of her studies that she, she, among her discoveries of her studies, one of the things that she um, has recently uncovered that has received a lot of press is is she's studying um, plasma levels of tau uh, protein, and I know you have a strong uh, head injury uh, area here as well with uh, Hillary and others, um, but, um, and she is in touch with, with your folks as well. But the, the idea that the levels of tau will increase after an injury and they fluctuate with the recovery of the individual, and it looks as if that may be one of the biomarkers that will help to predict return to play. So that, and this study has been done in male and female collegiate uh, athletes who have suffered concussion. And, and so she is also working with the National Football League and football, she's expanded her study so she's looking at others and they're of course quite interested in when their quarterbacks might be able to return to play. Uh, so, uh, but this has, but it is very, uh, it's very personalized uh, for individuals, and we're very uh, we're excited about this because it does look predictive, uh, and um, is something that we can uh, we can hopefully export. and And it's a good example of following through the um, patient reported trajectory with the biomarkers as well. Um, so another area, and again, this is bringing Coles to Newcastle because this is another area that you all focus a great deal on, but, but one of the, I said before, it's about symptoms and also sometimes symptoms of the interventions that we do to be therapeutic. And so this study was done, I, I, I tried to use one that wasn't done here, Peg, because I know everybody knows your work very well. So this was done on this coast, but elsewhere. Um, one of the, the issues that we know with um, patients with uh, GI cancers is that the, um, the side effects of the treatment are particularly severe. Um, these, the GI side effects often are, are present even with other forms of, of cancer because just the chemotherapy itself tends to attack the cells that are most rapidly turn, turning over and that, of course, is the gut. Um, so what we, so the attempt now is to address the symptoms by looking at more targeted therapy, and this is pharmacological and non-pharmacological, along with the chemotherapy. And this particular study is out of UCS, look, UCSF, looking at the differences in symptoms with using that approach. And they did find that although there, certainly the symptoms still exist, that the lack of energy, cough, drowsiness, et cetera, um, and sleep difficulties were less frequent with the patients receiving both of these approaches. Um, they also, the dry mouth and the changes of taste were also less severe in patients with a combined therapy. Some of the other things that we do expect, loss of hair, et cetera, um, happen in this group, but we're not, for some reason, um, a source of complaint as much as, as these particular symptoms. So the idea is that, that um, for, some, for reasons that are very personalized, those particular symptoms might be more severe but might not be a problem, whereas these uh, are more of a uh, present more of a problem on an everyday basis. So, but the bottom line really is that other approaches may be able to reduce some of these symptoms and we need to find out what they are because once again, the one size doesn't fit all. Um, also, uh, we have, uh, there's a renewed interest in fibromyalgia now that, and I know that you have a historic interest in that here, but now that we have um, better ways to be able to trace the progress of it, both from a patient reporting point of view and from um, a, a molecular point of view and, and, um, and from some of the um, uh, cytokine responses. So 
So um, it turns out in this study, when they looked at the symptomatology of the patient population, there were three groups. One group who had very severe and debilitating symptoms. Um, one, uh, the second group had less severe, less debilitating symptoms. And the third group had variable symptoms, that they would be either uh, stronger or weaker over time, but it was unpredictable. And for those uh, working in um, the science of uncertainty, it will not come as a surprise, but the, um, so the, the most problematic uh, was the group where it was variable uh, responses, so that the, because they didn't know what to expect and they couldn't plan around the symptomatology. And so whatever the symptoms are, if you can stabilize them or with comfort measures or other measures to be able to have some level of expectability or predictability that the um, patient satisfaction and, um, and, and function was much higher, or would potentially be higher if we could do that. Um, so this, this is an interesting study in that we, um, there are a number of sociological tenets about how about how good it is for people to adapt to their environment of the new uh, country that they have, new society that they have joined. And, and so this study um, looks at, uh, unfortunately we know that as people uh, come to the American culture often, they're healthier, the diets are healthier before they adapt to our very fine American diet. And um, so we, we think about the children and we worry about the kids and you know how they're you know, not eating healthy meals at school and they're not eating healthy meals after school. So, well, this study looked at the mothers of the children that were most well adapted. And it turns out that it's a two-way street. It's a, it's a reciprocal relationship so that the mothers of the more assimilated children, the children who are more assimilated into our culture, had um, uh, much less healthy diets. They, they had ate fewer meals at home, they had fewer fruits and vegetables, higher levels of dietary fat, um, and consume more sugary beverages. All the things that we know <laughs> are part of our diet that we're trying to address. Uh, and we're trying to address it in the children and the teenagers. Well, it turns out the moms are being as negatively influenced by their kids as, the, as their kids are by our prevailing culture, uh, our dietary culture. So um, I, I think the message is pretty clear here that we have, once again, to look at the whole family, and not just one part of it. Um, so we know that there are health disparities in our country, and there are racial differences in healthcare utilization. And so one of, our, one of our scientists looked at the 2007-2009 recession, was, which was a particularly severe one. And during that period of time, a large segment of our population dropped their health care, dropped their insurance, dropped health care, um, and did and had very little access to, to health or health care. And in the African American population, that was a higher percentage of people. Unfortunately, as we came out of the recession and we rebounded, people who then began to resume their insurance and health care, et cetera, did not include that population in as large a measure. So that the health disparities that we already knew we had were made worse during that period of time, but have continued to be worse because that because we have not reached out to that population and followed through on what um, we might have had we been watching this trend. So, so this gives us um, uh, a great deal of information that w which will be helpful in not only uh, some of our community programs, but also hopefully in, in a policy way, um, but that's more complicated. Um, so looking, and again, looking at trying to determine where are the problems, what are the root of the problems, and what can we do about them, this study looked at one of our, as, as you all know, one of the highest uh, mortality rates for, for patients with cancer is those with, with lung cancer. And we know that uh, a lot of that can be attributed to smoking and pollution, et cetera. So not, all, not all of it, unfortunately. Um, we also know that it a, has a very high mortality in women as well as men, um, and some studies more higher in women than men. But we don't have a great deal of information about some of the specifics of what causes it in certain climates. We know that in certain areas it's worse. So this study looked at incidents and actually um, did identify, let's see if I can do this. 
Um, well, I will point. I'm, that's it's fine. Um, but identified the mortality you'll see in red here, which is in the southwest section of the country, which is it's also the stroke belt, but but also it turns out that it's a mortality belt for lung cancer. Um, and so we, but the interesting part of this study is that it looked at particulate matter pollution and areas where the particulate matter is particularly, thank you, Joey, thank you. Ah, I usually do this. Okay, and so the areas of the dark green, some of which you know, overlap and coincide with the mortality, are the areas where there's the highest particulate um, contamination. And, and so, so that's a good correlation. It's just correlative, but it is a good correlation because that's where the clusters of illness and ultimately in some of those areas, death. So it's important to know that that's an area where we really should focus our resources when we're talking about resource allocation, et cetera, um, as a country. But one of the interesting things about this study is that unlike what we intuitively think, that these problems are in the urban areas, which is where our focus as a country has been, and as, as in the states, has been on the focus of urban, you know, because of the number of cars and the pollution and all of that. Turns out that much of the, the death rate in this stroke belt and the particulate, uh, the particulate matter pollution is not in the urban areas, it's in the rural areas with the agriculture and with the machinery and all of that. So that we, without, it's an example of what you know intuitively is correct and you address the problem. This is an area where we really are not necessarily allocating our resources where they need to be. So that was, that's a pretty instructive study and we expect it, that it will have some uh, impact. Um, and my colleague, and environmental health sciences is thrilled with this and wants to work with us. Um, we, um, as you, we, well, you just got back from North Carolina, so we do have a branch of NIH at, um, at North, in North Carolina, the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and we've been working on developing stronger ties between the universities in there. In fact, we have a um, R, uh, K99 R00 uh, individual who is funded for us for the, uh, the grant, but they're doing the postdoc at NIHS and then they will be funded for the R00 portion from, from us to, uh, in follow up. Um, so it, it's, but these are the kinds of things that help direct, redirect resources, have a real impact because they're changing something that we have, that we, they're changing behavior that has been um, erroneously directed in another way. Um, so we know that uh, diabetes is, a uh, serious problem in teens. We, we know actually this, these studies address type 1 diabetes, but because of a variety of things that are um, happening in our country, the type 2 diabetes, which we've always said is adult onset diabetes, is now becoming um, not quite predominant, but becoming more uh, pronounced in the teen population. So many of the studies that we've addressed toward uh, type 1 diabetes would very easily um, address the same issues in the teens that have type 2 diabetes. Um, so, so this was a, a study that was an attempt to sort out the differences between the general stress of being a teen, which we know the identity, uh, the peer uh, influence, et cetera, um, trying to be an adult, trying to be accepted as an adult, et cetera. Most of you probably know teens as well or better than I do. Um, but but there, so there's a great deal of stress associated with being a teenager, but there's also stress associated with having diabetes. And so which piece of the stress um, can we address related to the management of the diabetes versus the, the teen years or, or the, um, uh, the synergy of those two, which, which is, um, is a real problem in, in many of the teens. So the diabetes associated uh, issues were really uh, more uh, peers noticing an insulin pump. Well, that's not something that you know you would really think about, but the kids have to dress in a certain way so that that would not be noticed, which would be harder in some climates than others. Um, interference with condition with daily activities. We know we have a number of um, studies that have addressed that and the coping skills training that help to uh, uh, manage that. Um, uh, and also parental involvement and care. And this is sort of one of those yin-yang things where the parents 
really need to be involved in care, and the parents are involved in care up to about the teen years. And then at that point, some teens are able to manage the diabetes, some are not. Um, some are still not able to manage the injections uh, appropriately, and some are. But they really want to be in charge of what they're doing. So this whole um, stress, this whole um, push-pull stress of how much the parents are involved, how much the parents have to be involved, how much the kids want them to be able to, was an enormous source of stress. Um, and unfortunately, the and so it, so it, the good news is that we now know where to address the interventions, and the importance of it is that with the high levels of diabe diabetic specific stress, which was um, sorted out from the general stress, but specifically the diabetes uh, stress was associated with poor glycemic control as measured by the hemoglobin A1C. So, so um, and also self management that they really were less able to manage it um, and more likely to do an ostrich in the sand kind of approach, um, which was not helpful. Um, whoops, sorry. Um, uh, another area of symptom management and self-management um, is uh, another study with teens, um, which is a study with young adults who are experiencing cancer, um, who are actually uh, cancer and cancer survivors. Um, and so the children in this group, um, in addition to being a teen, um, of course, are dealing with all of the issues of cancer. You know, the difficulty of the treatment, um, the absence from school, the difficulty trying to perform in school, the um, onerous uh, concern of will they live or not, and, and then how will they live? You know, will they live, but then they will not be able to participate in their full lifestyle and so on. Um, and so, we have a number of protocols to deal with these things. The area of oncology nursing is, is really reason, very, very well developed in, in many ways. But what this study showed is that it, testing the different approaches, that it really was, it needed to be individualized for each of the groups and within the groups, sometimes the individuals, that there were so many different things that that they were worried about that were not what, what the nurses had thought or what the family had thought. And so, so there are a whole list of issues that they are worried about that we, we hadn't, actually, hadn't actually considered or were not addressing. And, and so what came out of this as well was that um, a, a renewed uh, interest on trying to, in addition to the self-management, the group self-management, helping the adolescents to help other adolescents um, in finding out what the issues were and then addressing them uh, is a much more promising way forward. Um, we, we've been uh, funding the, uh, the SWAN study for a number of years, uh, a, a portion of that, and the results of that have been very uh, informative and, and very impactful. And this is uh, a, a good news study uh, that I, I was noticing this morning early, there are a lot of people out running in this fairly cold weather and they <laughs> didn't have any jackets or anything on it. So, so this is another one of those things that I'm telling you something that you already know. But the good news is that, that this study has shown that, that even moderate levels, so you don't need to be one of those people that's out at three o'clock in the morning in the dark with your <laughs> reflective jacket and you know, freezing to death running, but that even moderate levels of sports, engaging in a sport uh, or exercise, does um, contribute to better physical functioning um, for uh, mid middle aged women, uh, mid midlife women, and and so um, so that's uh, that's the good news that it really is making it, and it's making a difference over a long term. This is a longitudinal study, so so that it is um, you really are when you say you're getting up to the gym. When you say it's not about now, it's like I'm going to live longer. I want to enjoy it, and that really will uh, that really will pay off according to this study. Um, also, just. Coincidentally, um, and not surprisingly, obesity, smoking, and lower health status were characteristics of the lower physical activity groups. And, and so many of those things, as we all know, tend to use up the energy that you do have. And so I think, uh, but this was, uh, I, I wanted to make sure to include this because it's the good news that reinforces all the right things that you're doing, keep on doing them. Uh, I was excited too. <laughs> um, so moving on to the, the fourth area, the um, end of life and palliative care. Um, so this is an area that you were um, pioneers in, so I won't spend a, a lot of time on these slides as such, but, but just that we now, because we are introducing palliative care very early on when someone receives 
uh, diagnosis with a, a poor prognosis, lung cancer, pancreas, that, that palliative care is introduced early as a concept and introduced into the care if, unless the patient refuses it. And so this study um, uh, is one of those early studies in doing that. And, and it's not surprising to a clinician, but it is surprising to the general uh, aversion to, do, to discussing these issues, um, is that, that there is an association between poor outcomes and even in some populations mortality with, no, with a little or no discussion of what is the problem, what are the options, what are the potential outcomes. And so it is a case where people do better in general, even in this area, if they are informed and have some participation in the discussion. Um, it, it also, there was uh, improved quality of life um, and depressive symptoms uh, with this integrated approach. Um, and these are folks that are very sick from onset and um, had much more positive outcomes and, and said that they felt that they had a better quality of life. So this is good. Um, this study is an interesting one because it really didn't, it wasn't a study of depression, but one of the outcomes of it was that early palliative care intervention does moderate the, um, uh, the, the depressive symptoms. And, and it was um, also, it was just, it was a quality of life intervention. This is Marie Bakaitis out of uh, Alabama quality of life intervention, but what she found among her outcomes was that people were exhibiting fewer depressive symptoms and they had a longer survival in patients with a high depressive baseline who required it. And so, you know, we don't know, there's a great deal we don't know about resilience. It's now being studied more systematically, but again, the, um, this was a, a case where an intervention had a positive outcome that wasn't necessarily expected to, hoped to, but. Um, now this is an interesting, um, this is an interesting study. Jim Tulsky, one of our former council members who had the first center actually on palliative care in the country when he was at Duke, did this study. And, and it's, we do, we understand that, that often surrogates make decisions, but we don't necessarily, um, they don't get a lot of training for this. They don't get, you know, they're included in some of the conferences if they occur. Uh, but mostly it's who's the surrogate if this person isn't able to make a decision. And, and the study that he found was that there was a wide range of responses um, that, that in fact that the surrogates often had difficulty dealing with their anger, their um, own emotional uh, depression, the, the upset, the anxiety of not knowing, the pressure of having to decide. So that often it was very difficult for them to overcome that piece before they could get to what decisions should be made. Um, and so, you know, the outcomes really indicate to us, which we might, maybe we should have known this, but, but it, it isn't done in the healthcare system, that, that the surrogates, we really have to look at. What, who are the surrogates? What role do they play? How can we help? So it's another form, I guess, of looking at the caregiver component of, of uh, the surrogacy component of caregiving. Um, but it's fascinating, fascinating outcomes. Um, so um, in the last few, few minutes, um, I said I would get back to caregiving. We did have a summit on caregiving on campus. Um, uh, last summer, about seven institutes across campus partnered with us. Judy Woodruff was our keynote speaker. Um, we, about 1,000 people attended and participated. We do have a very detailed summary of this and of the recommendations on the website. I have a, we have a, a little overview introductory piece in, um, I guess, it was Nursing Outlook. Um, but, but the detailed summary is on the website so that you can benefit for, from the rich discussion. Uh, and so we will, we will have um, follow up on this. Um, most of you, I think, know, and I have an opportunity slide that I won't read, but we'll go over quickly. But, but um, that there are many opportunities now um, in Alzheimer's in the area of Alzheimer's because there are additional funds, and so we just got a budget, which means there's only like a half a year to spend the first pulse of this. So when we spend money quickly, there are only a few mechanisms that we have to be able to do that. Um, I can't. I think the announcement is on the street today or tomorrow, but, but one of the ways we often do that is of supplements and things like that, where we, like with ARA, we have to work fast. Um, but it will be an opportunity for people who are not working in the area of Alzheimer's to address something which would, the, of their studies that they could 
apply to that. So, I th so keep a close eye on that. We, we have a webinar coming up and we're going to be all over you to try to get you to, to respond. But, but one of the areas that is um, a reasonable area to address would be caregiving. Okay. Um, so just you know, moving forward on some of the things that are popping right now, um, um, one of the things that we're hearing a lot about is omics. Now omics, any omics study re results in innumerable amounts, uh, enormous amounts of data. And, and so we're trying to figure out, this is a very interesting paper which has a number of suggestions for what do we do with it, how do we do, um, how do we handle this, um, but it does offer for us symptom related data for further analysis. And many of the analyses that we're interested in, other people aren't gonna be doing. And that data is there. They're just not gonna use it for that. So we could have access to that. And some of these are you know, the clinical data, epigenomics, just it's a wealth of things. And so I would suggest um, perusing that paper and seeing which of these might be opportunities that you would be interested in. Um, we also, um, and this is a, another area that you're familiar with, so, so we're also um, pr moving forward on uh, using a common data element approach. One of the criticisms of of the studies that we, we do um, in nursing is that the, the results are very good, but the ends are small, the numbers are small. And so this would be a potential way to be able to pool data to draw conclusions based on larger data sets, et cetera. And, and so it is a way to consolidate, to increase power. And this is an experiment that we are doing now, which is really resting on the shoulders of the center directors of which you have a center and Peg Heitkemper has been very instrumental in helping us to do this. The center directors have just been amazing to be able to do that. And everything that they're, all that they're working on, um, are, we're, the papers are coming out, they're published as they come out. And so we're developing and now starting to use the common data elements um, and so we're very excited about that. We, we th in fact, we have had requests for people who are not part of the centers who may want to use them. And so we're working on, we, we figure we get the bugs out first and then we, then we can do that. But, but it really is um, an enormous opportunity for us to, to maximize. Um, so just moving on, this is just an FYI. We've been working with the Genome Institute and National Cancer Institute on developing a website for people who are working with um, genetics and have genetics components in their studies to be able to provide training on there for people who are interested, um, uh, common data element support for when that, as that is um, uh, developing, and also to be able to develop partnerships. So that someone will go on there and say, we're not monitoring, we're not, you know, we're not, um, how do you say, um, uh, we're not vetting the information on there. Everybody will be responsible for what they put on. But if someone says, I have a data set, I'm not using, does anybody, can anybody use this for anything? Or I'm looking for this, can you help me? So it really, we do think that it's going to be a really good resource for anyone who's working in the area of genetics. We have alpha tested it and beta tested it, and they're now just sort of doing the last little tune-ups. And so we do expect it to be active within the next, next month or so. Uh, whoops, sorry. I'm resting my hands here. Um, so, um, so anyway, just stay tuned for that one. Another uh, opportunity is, uh, and this is a, one specific example, but there are many opportunities for us with these large infrastructures, large um, collaboratives and cooperatives. This is a specific one for end of life and palliative care. It's a palliative care research cooperative group, which forms an infrastructure for anyone to do end-of-life research using this infrastructure. So you can write your R01 to use the infrastructure, R13, anything to use the infrastructure. It has uh, innumerable training tools, it has teaching modules, it has live help for people if you write in. Um, and this is a cooperative, collaborative actually, that involves some 150, the number keeps growing, it's, it's close to 200 centers across the country, so it's enormous. The people who, um, it's a, a cooperative we have, or a, a cooperative agreement with Duke and University of Colorado, who happen to be the ones who are funded to do this, but it's an enormous resource, so please look at it and plan to use it. Um, it is, um, they are, I'm not sure how they are doing as much. The funding is reasonable, but it, and it actually, in the beginning, we got some funding for this from the common front from the director. So, so we feel that this is um, a real resource. And it's also a good model for other ways of doing this in other areas as well. 
Um, I have to mention the All of Us study, which is the NIH-wide um, early, early started as a White House initiative under President Obama, but it is a, uh, it is going to be an enrollment of at least a million patients will, people rather, who will enroll their genetic data, a lot of all the demographic data. Eventually, um, it will, um, a number of lab tests avail will be available. So, and nursing has been very involved in this. We are on the committees to help form it. We have most of the community uh, outreach work that has been done has been done by, by nurses um, uh, at academic centers and uh, with the communities. Michelle Hamlet, who is our program director, who is working with this, um, was the moderator for the recent three-day workshop. She was the moderator for the whole thing. So we're very uh, involved in this and think it has a wonderful uh, set of opportunities for us as it moves forward. Um, the, I mentioned the Common Fund. There are a number of things that are being funded by the Common Fund, which are sort of trans-NIH areas. The one, there's, these are the newer ones are listed here, but one of the ones that's still on there is one that I co-chair with Richard Hodes, the Director of National Institute of Aging on the Science of Behavior Change. Um, it was the first one in the Common Fund that had that was not molecular, <laughs> and, uh, and it still is making some really good, and it, it's not only making good contributions, but it has paved the way for others. So we now are looking at exercise at a molecular, at a molecular level, but nevertheless, and so I think it's really, um, it is, but it's something that we ask you for ideas for, and so these um, are trans NIH initiatives that are put forward. So um, I know we're getting close on time here, um, but I just want to remind you that we have NINR sponsored initiatives and we also have NIH sponsored initiatives. So make sure that you do check the website for, for all of these. Um, um, and I, I won't go over this in detail, but just to remind you that the new rules for clinical trials are out, you know they're out. Mike Lauer, who is the director of the Office of External Research, is coming to our council in May, the first day. And so that talk will be archived so that you can hear his whole talk. Um, uh, because the one that I am most interested in, I think will be most helpful to us, is the single IRB. I think that will be most helpful. And it, it's complicated, but we've done it in the collaboratory. So I know we can do it. Um, so um, in my closing comments, I want to just say a little bit about training and underscore many times italics and bold what Azidi said when we were starting this. I have always felt all of, all of the, these years, we invest a higher percentage of, of our budget in training than almost any other institute on campus with the accept exception of general medical sciences, which is the training institute. Um, because I have always felt that we don't have enough of a research workforce. We won't, even at a steady incline, we will not have enough of a research workforce to do everything important that needs to be done in any of our lifetimes. I mean, we just really need to keep building. And so the recent trends of the decrease in enrollments in PhD programs is extremely distressing. Um, I think as we, you know, I, I would say that it's actually, be, it's urgent to do something about this. Um, so we will be um, hopefully addressing that as, as we move forward. We, we just feel like um, it isn't about either or and it isn't about one program versus, it's just about PhD programs are important to develop the science that we need to improve patient care and to impact on policy. And we've worked really hard to get our place in the sun and so it's really important that we have a cadre of bright, young, and middle-aged researchers to replace the people that are leaving every day, which is another alarming thing. Um, so these are, these are programs that you've participated in and you know about. Summer genetics we are still offering. The boot camp changes a little every year. If you want to be in it, apply early because it fills up within hours, literally. But we do keep offering it. Um, and the graduate partnership program, I want to mention simply because it is a terrific opportunity. It is um, for students in the PhD program to come to campus and do their research with an NIH mentor and um, their university mentor. So we're in close contact. They still, they're still your student. They graduate from your school, et cetera. Um, we, but they do, they tend to, when the poster prizes 
on campus, across the campus. They do very well when they finish. Um, this is an example. Kristen uh, Weaver came from NYU, and she's now doing a postdoc at Hopkins. And you know, they just they just do well. Um, they're uh, all over the country. I could name other examples, but she's the most recent graduate. Um, so um, it is some. It's it's a wonderful environment. The intramural environment is a terrific environment. It's very stimulating intellectually, and it's very collaborative. So. Um, we, and it's a, it's a group where they work hard, but they seem to always be having fun. Interdisciplinary, um, start, we have high school kids in the summer, and undergraduates, and PhDs, we have vet students, we have, you know, they're just, our program, because it's clinical, and because it shows, you know, you go from lab to the patient and back, it has a lot of attractives, and we can design projects that can be done in short periods of time, so students come in, they get excited and then they leave. So, so it's really um, very exciting. So I would say put that on your roster for um, experiencing it some way or other. The program was designed to be a, a national resource, to be a resource to extramural. So we feel very strongly about that and really um, encourage you to come to visit. If you happen to be in town, um, you know, we have tours also um, and they're pretty good about it's not at the drop of a hat, but they're, you know, we've had congressional tours, you know, coming tomorrow and stuff like that. So they're fairly used to having people come on short notice. Um, so with that, I, uh, I'm sorry, I know we, we started a little late, so I'm trying to talk fast. Um, and um, just um, say, please visit our website. We're redoing it, and so any comments you have, we'll put them in this time or next time. Um, but just um, contact, we are available. The program directors are here to help. Really, we want to, promote your career in science. So um, again, um, we um, have many opportunities and I just think, you know, research is fun and it's a way to make an impact that's gonna last a lot longer than any of the rest of us. I was telling this story, I don't wanna take time because I was telling Julian, I, something I did like 15 years ago now suddenly is hot and all these people are writing, it's like, they run, it's a, it was a, uh, the idea that the, the cerebral spinal fluid in the brain was not an inert substance, but it was part of a transport system. And, and typical scientific thing, we went as far as we could go with the technology available. And you know, you, if you have someone, if you have a, a theory that is well entrenched, you can't just wound it, you have to kill it dead. And so, so now I, you know, and it also actually, it's, it's being, it's considered very important in sleep too. So there you go. Um, I, I know that we are uh, doing a time thing, so I'm, I'll finish and I will be available for questions as we walk out the door or whatever, whatever you think is the best, I'm, I'm happy. I think we have time for a few questions now. Okay, perfect. And anything you want, yeah. Hi, I'm Brenda Zeeler. I just have a question about, um, I know, we know your focal areas, but even Mike Lauer just sent out a blog yesterday about the importance of team science. Yes. And so what is NINR going to do about infrastructure supports that people could do more team science? Knowing that a lot of the studies that you show, they have their own teams, that's different than actually requiring an inter, you know, interdisciplinary right. team or so we have a number of different approaches to team science. Um, we, um, it's a little hard for us to do a national infrastructure for all team science across the country that's not, um, ha doesn't have a specific focus, but we're very amenable to people designing different kinds of teams and trying to do, um, and we don't, you know, we don't monitor local politics, so we can't, um, you know, we can't tell people to team up with each other. But I would say that the, the CTSAs or CTSIs have bec are becoming a national resource in that way and becoming a model for doing that. Whether or not you're part of it, I know, every, and it's different everywhere, I know. Um, it is here, very much. Yeah, and so I think that's a, that's a big piece of it. And, and that's also something where you can, you can have spin-offs from that so that you can do other things where you're only using their consultative services or whatever. So I think any time that there is an infrastructure in your university setting or your academic setting, that's a good place to start looking to see if they're, because those are people that are already, you know, used to doing teams. Part of the team science issue 
there's a lot of sociology with it, as you know, because you're doing it. And so I think if you're starting with people who already have mastered that uh, communications, et cetera, that's a good place to start. Um, you, every place is different. We also encourage multiple PI, use of multiple PI, because many schools and university settings are constrained by what they can do because of their business model structure. And yeah, and you all actually, unless things have changed a lot, had a pretty good structure here because compared to the rest of the country, you would receive more of the indirect costs, not just to the school, but even to the department. Um, and so, uh, but, but to the school, certainly. And that was something that doesn't happen all the time across the country. Um, so I think, um, but I, I th the other deterrent to it is the tenure structure. So you need to make sure that you are, whatever you're doing, you can start out as a team member and we encourage that. But somewhere along the way, you need to make sure your specific role is identified. See, um, and I should have been more clear. I really wanted to know what would be the interest, the mechanism that NINR and such in putting out an RFA that required uh, a team approach. Okay. So um, really yeah. Um, so we've thought about that, um, and we've thought about doing it, you know, we, we tend to put out a few fewer RFAs in this time of fiscal constraint, because if we put an RFA, it's money off the table that only certain people can apply for, and so I have a hesitancy to, you know, if we get an extra five million, say we're going to put two million into this, which is, you know, 40% of the whole, but having said that, we do program announcements, which we take seriously, um, and and the indication when we put out any, any announcement is that, that there's, the implication is that there's money involved because if we want you to apply, we're not going to ask you to do that unless we think that's important. Um, so I think, you know, we, we're still struggling with, how, with the best way to do that. Um, we're more, I mean, Mike will tell you that we're, we're the team science people. I mean, he's writing, he writes that so that other people will do it because in nursing, the preponderance of that and the ability to do that is, is much higher than many of the others. I, I've been a little surprised, actually, but some of the independent researchers that we have <laughs> around <laughs> us. Uh, so, yeah. But we, but we continue to support it and think it's a good idea. And so, you know, and also feel free to talk to the program people with your suggestions as well, because um, if they hear it enough or often enough, you know, it filters. Other questions? Yeah. Um, hi. Um, thank you for the excellent talk here. Um, I am one of the uh, uh, PhD prepared nurse who decided to actually choose a career at a clinical site setting mm -hmm. uh, because I truly believe when the science, especially the implementation of science, should be at a clinical setting. Mm -hmm. And also, I think a lot of the new Nurses, um, if we want to have them interested in research, um, we should inspire them at their earlier career at that side. Um, but uh, I also find it's a struggle as a person who trained in PhD and uh, in the early stage of uh, my research career to choose that route because um, you kind of sacrifice you know, a lot of your relationship in the academic side and also the time to really publish and uh, writing grants. So I, um, I wonder if you have some wisdom um, for people like me who really choose a different track um, in uh, doing nursing research more at the clinical side and how to really research program going and also get fundings for some of the more clinical focused. Okay, um, so I wouldn't claim to be a seer, but I, I do have some ideas. Uh, so first of all, we agree with you completely. We do think that it is important to do research in a clinical setting. Your timing is good because there is a wave that is growing slowly but more rapidly recently of appointing 
CNOs across the country for um, chief nursing officer who has a clinical and an academic role of, of equal importance. Um, there is a move to uh, increase or enhance the, the relationships between those two so that there are strong bridges being built. Um, we all, the only thing I would say is that it is different and depending on where you are and what's happening, you're at a very academically oriented campus here. So you may have advantages that others may not, and I, I can't speak to the whole, but you just want to make sure that you get help in your design of your study. Um, and we have people here and also program directors as well can give you some advice. Um, also, you want to make sure that if there are certain areas where you um, may need a consultant that you get the appropriate consultants on. I would suggest you know, the usual getting outside reviewers for it, getting people to help you to propose it. Um, and, and there are other steps along the way that you can do, but basically what you want to do is to just simply make sure that you have a well-constructed competitive application that has clear outcomes. And also that you, have, that you address whatever the confounding variables are in the environment, uh, changing personnel, changing whatever it is, um, uh, um, variable resources, whatever. Make sure that those are addressed realistically in, in the application. It, it also doesn't hurt to have preliminary data. So um, I, uh, if it's any consolation, I, I know, you know stories that are like an, an and of one are not helpful necessarily, but I was at, uh, I was at the State of the Science meeting one year and I was just you know, getting a cup of coffee and someone came up to me and asked me that very question. And she said, I know it's hard, but, and I, so we had the conversation, very brief, you know, and she went off and I said, and I said you know, so put it in. And, and when you get your summary statement, you know, call because it's hard to get funded the first time, et cetera. So if it's, oh, eight months, nine months later, something like that, I get this phone call at the front desk and my assistant said, so-and-so is calling you. I said, so-and-so, I, I don't recognize that name. And she said, you said that, you sh that she should call you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was this individual. And she had gotten an incredibly good score that was bound to be funny. But she didn't even know that it was a good score <laughs> because she was still new to the system. And so I told her, I, she said, well, you told me I should call because I might have to rewrite. And I said, why don't you wait till you hear from program on that one? <laughs> and she got funded. And, and that was maybe 10 years ago. And she's now. Um, uh, full professor with tenure, and you know she she has done well. <laughs> anyway, um, so I would say you know if it's something that you want to do, your reasons for doing it are well grounded. It, it's something you're passionate about, and you're in the right place at the right time. Just make sure you get your ducks in a row to facilitate so you have more of the odds in your favor. <laughs>